What you're looking at is the gap motor running and producing electricity, which in turn is causing the light to operate. Note that we've removed the large gear used in lifting to weight, which was a 6 to 1 ratio. Also note that we don't have an alternator or generator attached to the motor. The reason for that is because it is a generator. We're going to take readings of and record the RPM, voltage, and amp readings, both of the input to the coil and output to the light. Then I'm going to explain in as much detail as I can just how this device operates. We chose a light bulb which would absorb just enough energy to operate the motor at the same speed as we did the test on June the 9th of 2010, the date we did the video of lifting the weight. Today's date is April the 12th, 2011. The bulb is a Sylvania part number 3157. 12.8 to 14 volts with a watt rating of 8.3 okay the RPM is 322.47 now, using the oscilloscope, we're going to measure the electrical input and the output. There we have it. It happens that quick. You might have noticed that the amp reading on the oscilloscope was in the minus. Naturally, that was incorrect. I didn't notice till some time later when I was working with the data in the spreadsheet. What had happened was, prior to the test, I lost power to the oscilloscope, and when I powered it up again, I forgot to calibrate the amp probe. My nice little camera and lighting setup was already dismantled, and I needed another test. So I did another test, and here it is. The RPM of the test was 313.35, not 322.47 as shown prior. This might not seem too important, but we do want it to be as correct as possible. So the RPM we're dealing with is 313.35. In the video of the lift test, the RPM of the geared mechanism was 52.25, making the RPM of the motor 313.5. So you can see that we're very close to an exact reproduction of the speed we were while lifting the weight. Here we have a chart. Some call it a graph, showing the electrical input and output of the device, as recorded. We're not lifting any weight, so the motor's not under as much load or strain as it was on June the 9th of 2010. I have the chart divided into three sections. The left section is where the power is applied from the batteries, which is 43% of each cycle or revolution of the motor. The center section is where power from the batteries is turned off and the back EMF is coming out of the coil. Note at this point the voltage, which is in green, goes negative, falling below the zero line. That's because when back EMF comes out of the coil, the polarity is reversed. Also note, there's no wattage, a term for measuring power. That situation continues to this point. 
where the voltage again goes positive. Now this section makes up 18.3% of the cycle or revolution of the motor. Now we come to the right section of the chart. This section makes up 38.7% of each cycle or revolution of the motor. This is where the power is applied to the light, here and only here. Of course, the device is producing electricity throughout the entire cycle, but only 38.7% of the time is it powering the light. That's why the pulsing. In the 43% of the cycle, the power produced is helping operate the motor. I feel that's the reason for the weird looking waveform. The oscilloscope doesn't know where the power is coming from. It's just telling us what it sees, both in numbers and in a visual representation. If you examine the numbers in the spreadsheet data, I repeat, if you examine the numbers in the spreadsheet data, they do match this waveform. As you can see here, the input watts on the 43% section is 1.55, and the output watts of the 38.7% section used to burn the light is 1.71, making the percent of unity 110.06. Now that's what we call over unity. Maybe not by much, but nonetheless over unity. Now I'm going to demonstrate the action of the relay and how it relates to this chart. Here you see an animation of the relay in action. In real life, it's making a complete switch in 191.479 milliseconds. Now that's under 192 one thousandths of one second. Note the connection on both ends of the wire coming from the coil is being broken. If only one end is broken, the back EMF can't escape quick enough and the speed of the motor will be reduced significantly. Also, for you electricians out there, you'll probably notice that I've wired the relay in an unorthodox manner, just the opposite of what's considered normal. In this position, the power is being applied to the coil from the batteries. This is the 43% section as shown here in the chart. In this position, the 18.3 section of the cycle, note the power from the batteries is removed from the coil and the light is still not burning. This is where the back EMF comes out of the coil. You can see in the chart where the voltage is going negative and there's no wattage, also known as power. In this position, the 38.8% section, the switcher has made contact with the bulb and the light's on. This continues on and on each and every cycle or revolution of the motor. Also note that I'm checking the voltage and the amperage here on the coil side of the relay. I'm not interested in how much energy is made available to the coil only how much energy the coil is consuming. That brings us to this question. Just how much energy is the coil consuming? There are those, only three to date, who state to me that the voltage input to the coil is 45. One even stated that it was there for the entire cycle. All three agree that the amperage is correct. Neither of these three individuals has ever seen this device in person. All engineers who have seen it in person agree with me and my findings. 
according to Ohm's law, which is unchangeable and one of the laws of physics, one can know the voltage in a coil if he or she knows the amperage in the coil and the ohms of the coil. Well, the ohms of the coil is 10.6. And since we all agree the amperage is correct, and we must conform to the laws of physics, then we must interpret the findings as follows. I feel the oscilloscope is reading the input from the batteries and the input of the electricity being produced in the coil by the magnetic forces. And in doing so, its interpretation of the voltage coming from the batteries isn't fully correct. It can't distinguish how much is coming from the battery and how much is coming from the process. So it just puts it all together. Here we have the same data, the only difference being where the oscilloscope stated the voltage, I multiplied the amps in the coil by the ohms of the coil. I did this for the entire 2,500 readings. I feel that by doing this, brings the findings in compliance with Ohm's law. You know, the laws of physics. I know there are those that believe in order to obtain over unity, that so-called impossibility, one has to defy the laws of physics. Now that simply isn't so. What are the laws of physics? Well, simply put, they're the laws of God. Here we have the graph according to the laws of physics. See how the voltage in green follows the amperage and watts, which is in gold? Here's the 43% portion where power from the batteries is being applied to the coil. And here's the 18.3% section where the back EMF is coming out of the coil. Note how the voltage goes negative and there is no current. And here's the 38.7% portion where power is being applied to the light bulb. According to Ohm's law, which is one of the unchangeable laws of physics, the input watts on the 43% section is 0.13 and the output watts of the 38.7% section used to burn the light is 0.17, making the percent of unity 134.97. Now that's really what we call over unity. The DC voltage being applied is not continuous. It's what we call pulse DC. I searched the internet for Pulse DC. I chose three photographs to use in this video. Here's a photo demonstrating Pulse DC. Now here's another photo showing Pulse DC. Now here's the photo I really want you to see. It's demonstrating Pulse DC with a full explanation of what's going on. It just happens to confirm what I've been saying about using Ohm's Law to check the input power of the gap motor. Above the chart it states, PWM pulse over a car lamp at 500 Hz and 30% duty cycle. At this low frequency, the lamp behaves almost exactly as a true resistor, i.e., or that is, the voltage and the amperage follow each other. Below the chart, it states that red is the volts and blue is the current. Notice how, in fact, throughout the entire time, cycle after cycle, the voltage and the amperage does follow each other. Do yourself an internet search on Pulse DC and you'll eventually find this chart. 
you'll also find out who did it and that he's no fly-by-night two-bit engineer. He's a very accomplished man. I know there's lots of people out there who possess the knowledge of how to extract the back EMF produced by this device and put it to some positive application, which would mean even more output, maybe as high as 18.3% more, which would bring the over unity to 153.27. I want to compare the test I did today April the 12th of 2011 to the test I did on June the 9th of 2010 where we were lifting the weight. Here we have the chart of lifting the weight on June the 9th of 2010 as recorded. In this test I was checking the voltage on the coil side of the relay and the amperage on the battery side of the relay. This is why in the back EMF section where the voltage is going negative, we see wattage or power produced, as you can see here in the gold. From where the voltage goes negative to the right end of the chart, there was no power applied from the batteries. So I just cropped that portion of the chart off and calculated the input to the coil from the 43% section on the left. And as you can see, we had a continuous output from lifting the weight of 7.07 .07 watts with an over unity of 169%. Here we have the same data only figured using Ohm's law. Here we had an over unity of 241%. I feel the test of lifting the weight gives a truer picture of this device's capabilities, for it shows the continuous output over the entire 100% of the cycle, where in today's test, we only see the brief output of the 38.7% section of the cycle, where the light is being powered. Looking at today's test using Ohm's Law, to me, was a bit confusing. I was expecting to see something quite different. Just what? I don't know. The input and output numbers were so low it made me start to think maybe I should look at it from the point of using Ohm's Law for the input and the as recorded for the output. As you can see, that would put the unity percentage to 1341.12. That's 1341.12% of unity. Now that would really be something. Is it true? I seriously doubt it. You know, examining this stuff can almost drive one nuts, or at least drive me nuts. With that in mind, I think it's best to just compare the two tests using the as-recorded method. Again, I feel the test of lifting the weight gives a truer picture of this device's capabilities, for it shows the continuous output over the entire 100% of the cycle, where in today's test we only see that brief output of the 38.7% section of the cycle where the light is being powered. Another thing I wasn't expecting to see in today's test was the fact that it was producing more energy than it takes to operate the device. Now that was a real shocker to me. I did this test mainly because I felt most people want to see over unity in the form of electricity and not just doing some physical work like lifting the weight. Today's test has reassured me that this device truly is an over unity apparatus and that the test done on June the 9th of 2010 proves the percent of unity was a minimum of 169 with a possibility of it being 241. 
so I don't have a problem making the claim of overunity and that it was done using magnetic neutralization. I know there's lots more research and development and perfecting that needs to be done to put an affordable device similar to this in every home and automobile. For that to be done, the word has to get out there. The more people that know about this, the better. That's where you can help. You're watching this video right now. And right now, you can download it to your computer and send it to friends. Or forward this link to others so they can see it. If you're one of the many who've purchased videos from me, feel free to copy them and give them to as many people as you like. Note I said give, not sell. I think most everyone's heard the old saying, the window of opportunity. Well, with this device, there appears to be a window of opportunity where over unity is possible. An appropriate speed for an appropriate load for an appropriate magnetic force. Find those things for a particular size apparatus and hold it. And there you'll have it. More power out than in. Set control limits to where the device will always be within that window of opportunity and you're there. In my previous videos, I've been careful not to claim over unity. You know, that so-called impossibility? Well, in this video, I am going to claim over unity. I feel it's now up to someone else to prove me wrong or prove me right. Some may call me crazy, an idiot, or far worse. You know, that really don't bother me. After all, I've been called all those things many times. I'm now 65 years old. And in my age, the thing that really concerns me is how God feels about me. And am I bringing Him a little pleasure? Does anyone really think I came up with this on my own? Now, I'm not claiming free energy. Nothing is free. I'm simply stating that this device produces more energy than it takes to operate it. And I don't think it's been the first to do so. And certainly... It won't be the last. Before I posted any of my videos on the web, I did lots of searches on magnetic amplification and neutralization, magnetic amplification, and magnetic neutralization. I came up with just a handful of results, and in no way did they pertain to how it's being used in these motors. Now, there's literally thousands and thousands and thousands. I'm beginning to think this just might be the one that the powers that be won't be able to stop. Today is April the 12th of 2011, and it's been nine months since I posted the linear motor on my website. I've received many emails and phone calls, and I know there's lots of individuals and organizations throughout the world working on this project now. I don't think it'll be very much time go by till some business will have something that we can all use in our homes and automobiles. Lord knows we need something about now. I hope this video gives a clearer picture of this device and its possibilities. Oh yeah, there's one more thing. Quite a number of people have asked me about heat. Does the coil get hot? Does the magnets heat up? The video that's been playing in the background is part of a one-hour video of the motor running and the temperature of the coil and magnets taken just before and every 15 minutes of that one-hour period. Here are clips of that one-hour video showing me taking the temperature. I think it should put to rest any concerns one may have on the issue of heat. Uh. 
Now this is the temperature of the coil. It's 12.59 p.m., almost 1 o'clock, 73.9. Now I'm going to get the temperature of the uh, magnets back here. And they're uh, 71.5, and it's now 1 p.m. Now I'm going to start the motor up and run it for one hour. And every 15 minutes, I'm going to check it, and we're going to check the heat buildup on the coil and the magnets. Okay, 93.2 uh, degrees, 93.2 degrees, and it's 115. The magnets are 71.8, and it's 116. See, they still feel cool, you know, I mean, might feel just warm, that's it, not even lukewarm, you might say. Well, it's 145, it's been 45 minutes. And we'll check the uh, temperature here. Uh, 108. 108.3 and it's 145. Get that where you can see it. 108.3, 1.45 p.m. Been at it 45 minutes. The magnets, well, you don't want to drop anything there, the thing will get stuck. The magnets, 73.8, 73.8, 146 p.m. So we've been at it 46 minutes. You know, to me it just feels kind of lukewarm. I know at 120 degrees, you couldn't hold your fingers on there more than just a couple of seconds and you'd have to jerk your hand away because it would burn you. It'd feel hot. I'll put the back side of my fingers to it and, you know, it, well, 98.6 are body temperature. Of course, my fingers are not that hot, but uh, still, you know, that's pretty good demonstration. You know, it's just warm. Well, it's been uh, one complete hour since we started this test. It's now 2 o'clock p.m. So I'm going to check the temperature of the coil. Uh, 116.8 at 2 p.m. 116.8 degrees Fahrenheit at 2 p.m. That's the coil. Now let's check the magnet. The magnets are 74.4. 74.4. Degrees Fahrenheit. After one hour. Like I said, I can put my fingers on this thing. No problem at all. Still just feels lukewarm to me. So, uh,
You know, really, it don't feel 116 degrees to me. Let me back up here a little bit and measure it. I'll bet it's not. There, I've got 110. Let me... Uh, Hundred and ten point eight. You know, maybe the magnets have an effect on this thing. I was holding it a little close. Let's see. Uh, yeah, about hundred nine, hundred and ten. There's hundred nine point six. Anyway, I believe that the coil was going to heat up uh, into a uh, bad situation. It would have already done it long ago. Like I say, I'm putting the back of my fingers on there. Not down in there. On that coil. And nothing. I'm going to move this other camera over there get real close to that thing so you can really see me putting my fingers on that thing. Okay, you'll still be able to see that light flashing on that table. I think you'll be able to see that uh, I'll have my fingers right on that thing. Yeah, you can see the light flashing there real good. And uh, like I say, I'll just put my fingers right there on it. Just, just touch it. I would say lukewarm. Yeah, 109.2. I'd say, I guess that is lukewarm. After two hours and four minutes of operation. I think I said two hours and four minutes after one hour and four minutes, not two hours. In the video of June 9th, 2010, we did a simulation of the motor running. We were just pulsing a coil of the exact same size and the exact same voltage which was made available from the batteries. In that test, which is available for you to watch, the contacts of the relay were literally cooked, completely burned, as you can see in this photo. It didn't take but a few minutes for this to happen. Now here's a photo of the relay used in the one hour and four minute run of the motor used for the background in this video. After that one hour and four minutes, it still looks brand new. Not one sign of heat buildup. Not one flaw. The only difference in the two relays is that the one used in the simulation had no magnetic effect produced by the gap motor generator. And this one did. Now there's a lot to be said for that. Just what? I don't know. Take a look at the first telephone. A far cry from what we have today. Look at the first electric motor. Quite different from what we have today. Hey, take a look at the world's first automobile. 
How would you like to make a trip from the Atlantic to the Pacific in that? You know, we as a people have made some huge technological advancements in the past and continue to do so. Wonder what this technology will look like in a few years. Thanks for watching and for your interest in this project.